content warning, this is probably going to be, of all the episodes we've made so far, the most extensive in terms of how we examine threats of violence, threats of sexual abuse, and documentation of sexual abuse. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone, I'm Crits Facts, a cartoon fox on the internet who dives into transphobia so you don't have to. Today I want to talk about a mechanism of bigotry. In third grade-ish, you probably learned the distinction between simple machines and compound machines. If your school didn't cover that, or you forgot, it's been a while. I'll walk you through it real quick. Simple machines is a social construct, social construct. theorizing the various mechanical parts that make up most mechanical devices, both artificial and natural. These are wheel and axle, levers, Holy, inclined plane, and the screw among others. Hey compound machine on the other hand is a device that makes use of several of these together. For example, a fishing rod is a wheel and axle, pulling a lever. And when they come together, they form a relaxing mini game that should be required in every video game ever. And there is a very important parallel here, and I want to talk about the salient exemplar fallacy. The components. Most forms of bigotry and vehicles for the spread of bigotry are complex machines made from the simple machines that are logical fallacies and psychological manipulation tactics. The salient exemplar is a term coined by George Lakoff in his 2017 essay, What is Hate Speech? He defines it thusly as this, Hate speech attributes to that class of people certain highly negative qualities taken to be inherent in the members of that class. Typical examples are morality, intellectual inferiority, criminality, lack of patriotism, laziness, greed, and attempts or threats to dominate their quote-unquote natural superiors. The method of defamation typically includes salient exemplars, that is, using highly rare and very ugly individual examples that has been sensationalized by the media and taking them as applying to the whole class. For example, we have Trump and his racist attacks on Latinos and Muslims, attempting to stereotype all of them and smear entire classes of people on the basis of a handful of individual cases. So let's break this down a bit. This particular tactic is a combination of the following. Hasty generalizations, cherry picking, confirmation bias, correlation implies causation, special pleading, group bias, system justification and appeal to authority. So let's examine the parts and see if we can't reverse engineer the device. Hasty generalization. Let's take the following pattern. Red square 4, blue square 5, red square 6, blue square 7, red square 8. What's the next square gonna be? If you said blue square, you're wrong. See, what this pattern actually is, is whether or not a number is a prime number. Red means it's not prime, and we start at red. 5 is prime, 6 is not. 7 is prime, 8 is not. And 9 is not prime. But the sample you got, it looked like it was just a simple alternating pattern. And if the rule had been red is even and blue is odd, this would have been an accurate guess. But again, you couldn't know what the rule was for sure until we pulled back the curtain. And speaking of prime numbers, Let's see if we can guess the next number in the sequence. 1, 2, 3, 5. If you guess 7, good guess. But actually, this is the Fibonacci sequence. Skipping the duplicate one, the next is 8, then 13, then 21. But those also happen to be prime numbers. And we were just talking about prime numbers, so you probably assumed that we were continuing to talk about prime numbers. The pattern lined up until it didn't. But what happens when this fallacy applies to sociology? In politics, analyzing bigotry in sociology, the hasty generalization fallacy is where we assume that there is a pattern because of what we attribute to specific cases, and often this includes conflicting correlation with causation. Confirmation bias. The very first rule of statistical analysis is you never test your hypothesis against the data set you use to form your hypothesis. Once a person thinks something is true, or that there is a pattern, we want to think we're right. I want to know what that's like. I'm always correct, so I never want for anything. <coughs> but this especially applies to prejudices, core beliefs, and justifying ideologies. 
For example, if you think that a certain group of people is predisposed to certain kinds of behavior, examples of members of that group doing that thing, you'll get dopamine because you feel smart for noticing that pattern. But when someone outside that group does the same thing, the same pattern reinforcing mechanism doesn't kick in. The mind discards it as apparent or irrelevant. Say for example, I said there was a correlation between people of the Virgo astrology sign and owning a Subaru. And then we went and surveyed a highway with a magic detector that, for every car we saw, told us the star sign of the owner and the make of the car. Let's see. Leo equals Chevy. Pisces equals Toyota. Tauren equals Subaru. Capricorn equals Hummer. Virgo equals Toyota. Slytherin equals Yamaha and Virgo equals Subaru. See, I told you! Any example of that trend being accurate is automatically seen as proof in our heads, and dramatically disproportionate weight to the actual ratio. There were two Virgos in this example, and two Subaros, and only one of those three separate cases quote-unquote confirmed what we saw. But the human brain is not always good at processing information that doesn't fit into anecdotes until we really zoom out and... Oh god fucking damn it. I picked this arbitrary example because I thought it would be easier to prove as just a nonsense supposition. But I actually could not get the kind of accurate data that would prove that said quote unquote correlation is bunk because people aren't actually collecting that data and instead we're getting people who believe in astrology. But the point I was trying to make was, if left to anecdotes, it's hard to overcome the tendency to only acknowledge the ones that confirm what we already think or what we want to believe, and to discard everything else as a fluke, erroneous, or just not representative. This is how turfs come to tell themselves that this is all a battle between transactivist predators and abusers and civil and respectful and brave women. I go to great length to never say anything that could even remotely be construed as a threat. Though God help them, they try. My bio currently reads, If you're transphobic, you're about to get dragged by a furry and drag. And despite obviously referring to dragging as in humiliating, they've accused me of threatening to murder people. You know what? No. I don't give a shit about what you think. Talk to me when death and rape threats are not the mode of operandi for this movement. It is largely a movement of toxic men and children who have no idea what real oppression or activism looks like. Note the gender critical side simply state their disappointment, whereas the trans rights activists spout vitriolic hate and threats. This is a prime example showing the difference between the two sides. Caring about your fellow human beings is a good thing, actually. When jokes reinforce narratives and beliefs that motivate mistreatment, maybe those jokes aren't the right things to do. Aren't you the one advocating shoving your beliefs down other people's throats via threats, coercion, boycotts, and riots? Because apparently I'm a 1NB boycott riot, but what they do is come in with the belief that they want to hold that transphobes are civil defenders of justice, and trans people and their allies are evil bigots out to control women, and they meticulously collect any quote-unquote proof of that, and then discard, discredit, or ignore any evidence to the contrary, or even just straight up do rape apologia, try disqualify, discount, or discredit counterexamples. Don't be paranoid. It's because 99% of perpetrators are sexual abuse of men. Duh. Wonder how much those stats would change if they fixed the laws that protect female rapists. The stats have already changed in recent years. Since they started registering rapists who identify as women as female perpetrators. Between 2012 and 2018, 436 individuals prosecuted for rape in England and Wales were recorded as women. And you believe all of them are trans women? Because sexual abuse by cis women doesn't count? As you explained to me, rape in the UK must involve a penis. So, yes, 
these 436 individuals being prosecuted for rape and not for sexual assault can only mean that all of those 436 rapists were trans women. By your logic, Brock Turner was not a rapist because he didn't use his penis on his victim. By your logic, his victim does not get the closure and validation of calling her abuse a rape. Her trauma must be demoted to non-rape sexual assault. Miss me with that garbage. Still, all those rapes were by trans women. That never happens turns out to be untrue. Yeah, I'm screenshotting this convo for the video I'm working on. Thanks! Not only do most serfs see this as a factional battle between trans people and quote-unquote natal females, because they forget that most transphobes are men, trans men exist and also need rights that are currently not protected in policy, and that most transphobes are also open and overt misogynists. And then you get some very interesting group bias kicking in. And with people claiming that a cis woman rapist was a trans woman, even after it was confirmed that she was in fact cis. Whole thread of them going in on it right here. a very important point here. You are not immune to propaganda. Efforts like this video to dissect and explain the mechanisms of bigotry can help inoculate you, but true immunity is probably impossible. At least not without you making an effort to resist it and work those biases and assumptions of your system. To actively purge faulty correlations between demographic aspects of people and individual merits and flaws, you have to call out this tactic and leave it instead of trying to counter it, because otherwise... 72 trans-identifying males, all convicted AGP, pedophiles, rapists, one arrested for assault despite having been caught online wanting to help little girls change their tampons, 56% discovered womanhood post-arrest, asterisk in red. They will keep using it until you crack. I went on Kiwi farms, have been assured them that LGBT people aren't all the depraved kinds of people they see us as. After months of reading their documentation based on actual digital footprints, I realized they're right about a huge number of us. It's very depressing. If the LGBT wants to be treated with respect in society, we are going to have to change. Life is not a strip club. We should try to destroy the moral fabric of society. For Kuma disgusting BS, I want to have a wholesome life. I'm done with the porn and the perverted shit. And just like that, this person who went into a hive of transphobia with the intent to prove them wrong has now internalized their beliefs, their disgust of trans people, their associations of transness with perversion. Call out this tactic wherever you see it and avoid spaces where the tactic is the norm. Cherry picking is the logical fallacy of selecting for data that supports your conclusion and ignores the rest. In the case of hate speech, it's often done intentionally. Confirmation bias is when it accidentally happens unprompted, because that's how the brain works. But cherry picking, when it's done deliberately, for example, say you wanted to make the claim that all Pixar movies are good, you would show Finding Nemo, Up, Monsters Inc, Inside Out, and Zootopia and pretend that any movie that anthropomorphized vehicles just didn't actually happen. But when it comes to social observations, the amount of evidence to get the human mind to see a correlation is unfortunately pretty low. There is a very clear tendency for people to see patterns and unfair casualty even when none exist. 
If a dude dates three women who all happen to be avid fans of Shania Twain and all of those relationships end badly, he might be inclined to assume a correlation there that liking Shania Twain's work is indicative that the relationship isn't gonna work. But when he forgot to mention that he's a serial monogamist and he has dated 12 other women, none of whom gave a flying fuck about Shania Twain and with whom all of these relationships ended in disaster, their taste in music doesn't suck, dude. Your ability to respect people's boundaries sucks. You know who you are, and if you're watching this, yes, I'm calling you out personally. Work on yourself before you get your heart broken again or you have nobody else to blame but yourself. Where was I? So anyway, Sometimes this fallacy is invoked by accident, simply because the human mind wants to see connections, even when there aren't there, but sometimes it's invoked intentionally. Say my friend had taken some time to work on himself, and then he wanted to get back into dating. He matches with someone cute, but his jealous and controlling friend doesn't want the relationship to work out because they might hang out less. And say this friend discovers that this cute new girl has a fondness for Shania Twain. Hey dude, he might say, you know those three girlfriends you had prior that all like Shania Twain and now it only hurts when you're breathing? Obviously the correlation is false, but you see now how, especially if dude 1 trusts dude 2, then suddenly the connection is planted in his head. Now dude is looking for signs that he might be hurt, that his new girlfriend is untrustworthy, and the next time she sings along to can only go up from here in the car, he pulls up to the side of the road and turns the radio down and says, I think we should see other people. Now this is a comparatively minor example of how this kind of thing can go down, but when we're talking about systems and demographics, this danger is multiplied and magnified. And now we have transphobic accounts who are cherry picking examples of trans people who have been convicted of criminal abuses and charges, gathering up these examples into collections that they have on hand, ready to quote unquote peak trans people, and every person they are able to get a fall for this false correlation gives them a rush of endorphins. Yes, I've convinced someone of the dangers of the trans ideology and let them in on a growing threat to society. I am the good guy, they tell themselves of course. And if you don't believe me, Dear God, this man is so dangerous, hashtag peak trans. This is Nikki Petrovikov. When Nikki went by her birth name of Walter Moore, he tied a woman between two trees and sized her with a knife and let her bleed to death. But now Nikki wants to be moved to a women's prison. Main state legislators just said absolutely, Nikki needs to feel safe. Not one of them mentioned the safety of the female inmates. He, he is the violent and abusive man, sex offender, who helped me hashtag peak trans. Last year, wonder what happened to Tiffany Scott, Andrew Burns at Fair Play for Women. Is he in the women's or a men's prison in Scotland? Is he still claiming to be a woman? Justin Murillo has a history of violence against women and was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Rodri Estrada. Murillo was held in a Vena Symbols jail while awaiting trial and is seeking placement in a Vena Symbols facility. Hashtag not our crimes. Between 2012 and 2018, 436 individuals prosecuted for rape in England and Wales were recorded as women. This is an astonishing number, and far worse than I ever could have imagined. 436 rapists recorded as women in England and Wales for a male crime. This is insane! Hashtag sex not gender, hashtag not our crimes! Now wait a minute, is this person saying that real women cannot commit rape? That rape is a male crime? Well, more on that later. But this is what transphobes do once they're actively invested in spreading transphobia. They aggregate things that they think will create a negative public perception of trans people and just spam them to whomever they can get an audience with. This person here accumulated obsessively instances of criminals who happen to be trans, ignoring all of the criminals who aren't trans, ignoring all of the trans people who aren't criminals, ignoring how abuse is an individual behavior and not caused by being trans or not. Should these transgender rapists, pedophiles, sexual offenders and violent criminals be allowed to self-ID their way into women's prisons? A threat. I went back and counted and 
that's、um, 46 individual cases. 46. Imagine being so obsessed with your bigotry that you collect instances of criminals of the group you want to hate so bad, as if they were Pokemon cards. Like, here is one turf just saying out loud what the tactic is, the way it's intended to twist public perception. I have an AGP photo on my phone for this purpose, after I've described the, the fetish in detail. I showed them the evidence because I know they are still imagining an effeminate. Post op, passing trans women. No progress can be made if they're picturing Hailey Cropper. And also admitting that she keeps porn on her phone with intention to show it to strangers with the sole purpose of altering public perception of a group. As if that's a healthy or reasonable or ethical or normal behavior. And isolated, these 46 cases look like a lot. They might even, if you look at them uncritically, make you think that there is an innate casual relationship between being trans and being an abuser. But again, that's because this is seriously and deliberately stilted representation. There are an estimated 450,000 sexual assaults every year in the United States. Only about 1,400,000 assaults get reported each year. If we use estimates from RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, only about 5 people are arrested for every 100 assaults that are committed. That would mean 22,500 people per year are arrested on charges of rape. And if 1% of those people happen to be trans, as is one of the common estimates for how many trans people are in the general population, Then, we should expect there to be 225 trans people arrested every year for rape. So, being able to find 46 over multiple different years isn't actually evidence that being trans or not has any effects on someone's sexual ethics. If anything, a collection of 46 trans people is evidence of this person's consuming obsession with trans people, an ability to look up criminal records, and craving for the sweet, sweet dopamines of confirmation bias. Speedrun find all trans criminals, any percentage completion. But then again, these people have not amassed evidence that trans people are disproportionately likely to commit crimes, and even if they did, it wouldn't actually be evidence that trans people. Simply by the virtue of being trans, are more likely than other people to commit crimes or be abusive. Advanced cherry picking. Got a narrative and you need some cherries to pick to reinforce that narrative? Why not just pick apples and say that they are cherries? This piece, which was published as we were wrapping up the script, is trying to push the trope that trans people are predators, just generally in coercing people to sex with us. And yes, people are running, running with that narrative, trying to spread it as far and wide as they can. How many of the straight feminists now posting on hashtag cis with the T have acknowledged the lesbians who yesterday disclosed experiences of sexual coercion, harassment, and even rape? Where are your hashtags and posting solidarity with those women? Where are your compassion for them? Here, Sister Ad Rider is legitimately trying to argue that if you support trans people as a whole, then. You are complicit in alleged abuses committed by anyone who happens to be trans, which is as absurd as saying that if you believe in women's equality, you are endorsing the crimes of Margaret Thatcher, the homophobia of Kim Davis, or the reckless endangering of other people done by Typhoid Mary. Why do you care so much about Thatcher and not the gay people she oppressed? But what is actually going on here is a bit more complex than what is being presented by the story. The apple being described as a cherry, and this is a subject for an entire video. Is trans people pointing out that transphobia is transphobia, even when people couch it as a dating preference? For example, imagine this interaction Hey cherry, would you be interested in dating my friend Greg? I think you two would be great together, and he just got over his boyfriend. To which cherry replies, Ah,、oh, he dates bi's. Do I look like a bi to you? To which the person replies, he's bisexual. Yeah, I don't date bisexuals. They're disloyal, nasty. We would all rightfully call Sherry biphobic there. Not because she said no to going out with Greg, but because she spouted as justification a biphobic stereotype and biphobic narrative. And Sherry should really stop being biphobic because biphobia is bad. And if she holds on into it, 
it's basically inevitable that she'll mistreat someone who is bisexual or spread her biphobia to others. But what bigots often do in these cases is that they twist it to act like you saying you should stop being a bigot is a moral mandate to date or have sex with someone you don't want to. If Vivian had just said, stop being biphobic, being bisexual doesn't make you less worthy of love, nor does it change your morality, how you value loyalty, then Sherry could easily dishonestly say, hey, Vivian is trying to pressure me into fucking Greg. When let's look at this response, where is Vivian saying that Sherry should be considered her rejection of Greg? Where is Vivian saying that turning down Greg specifically is biphobic? She's not. This is a fundamentally dishonest tactic, pointing out that bigotry couched as dating preferences is still bigotry for not morally pressuring you, pressuring you to change your dating habits, just asking you to stop being bigoted. Meanwhile, if we examine the kind of people claiming that trans people as a whole are just out there pressuring cis women into sexing the female penis. Oh, by the way, one of the people cited in this article is a serial rapist. Everyone should hopefully be aware of the abuse and assaults Lily Kate has committed at this point. I have deleted all my videos with her and I want nothing to do with her. Lily Kate assaulted me at my very first ex biz awards in the bathroom stall directly after assaulting another girl in another bathroom stall. Brave of you to speak out. Good thing that bathroom was sex segregated, right? Anyway, I look forward to all of the gender critical feminists who will stand with these survivors of rape at the hands of. Um, no. She may have committed sexual assault, but in the UK law, rape is only committed by someone with a penis, i.e., a male. To find a woman raping another woman, show me the definition of law. What can I say to ya? That's a gangster dude. That, that, that's a gangster dude. Correlation does not apply causation. Again, the propensity to pattern making in the human brain can sometimes be self sabotaging when we assume a direct casual effect between two different factors. But sometimes it's just a coincidence. Sometimes the relationship between two things is immensely different than the simple pairing of those data points would suggest. Consider for example, there is a 99% correlation here. Mathematically speaking, the p-value, the probability that this is all a coincidence, is very low, and yet, it's pretty obvious that this is a coincidence. It's an exploitation of the law of large numbers. If we gather enough various data and we have, eventually we'll find two unrelated data sets that happen to have an absurdly strong quote unquote correlation. But in sociology, often when things are related, the relationship might be different than what is frequently expected. Consider for example, Forbes and Friends and their rich people apologia. 17 habits of self-made millionaires from a man who spent five years studying rich people. Number one, they read consistently. Easier to do when you have free time and energy, which the working class are often less abundant with. Also easier if you don't have dyslexia or mental illness complications that make reading long-form works difficult, which might in turn make it hard to get higher paying jobs. But here, insiders frame this as if you read more, you'll get rich. The rich would rather be educated than entertained. Corley wrote that 88% of rich people devote 30 minutes or more each day to self-education or a self-improvement reading, and that most did not read for entertainment. The rich read to acquire or maintain knowledge, he said. Corley found that they tended to read three types of books, biographies of successful people, self-help or personal development books, and history books. Or Number 3. They hang out with other successful people. Now, which is more likely to explain this? That people with similar vocations socialize with each other via networking? That people in higher economic classes will often socialize with other rich people at bougie parties? Or... Number 9. They have multiple sources of income. Oh fuck. All I have to do in order to be rich is get lots of money. Why didn't I think of that? But the point I'm trying to make here is... Insider here is conflating habits that come easier to people of wealth and power and saying that they're wealthy and powerful because of those habits. And the reason you uphold that myth, 
that backwards explanation of the dynamic is because it makes the system seem more justified. And again, if you hang out with rich people, you might see those patterns of behaviors frequently and say, Ah oh, yes, these are things that will make me rich if I emulate them. Number 13. They don't follow the herd. All I need to do to join the rich herd is to stop a herd following. But sometimes there is a correlation, but it's not as directly casual as proposed. Number 15. They dedicate 15 to 30 minutes a day to just thinking. Look at this one, for example. I spend hours just thinking. Most people I know do, whether it's letting the mind ponder the subjects we study or just reflecting on media information. What are most conversations but multiplier thinking? But the fact this is done by, I think, most people and not just millionaires is missed if you only look at specific data set and assume, oh, that's why. But many of us who do any kind of analysis work will recognize this image. During World War II, a lot of planes were getting shot down in an effort to make the airplane more likely to survive. They meticulously documented where they found the bullet holes on all of the airplanes that returned to the base. They graphed them as a density map as seen above. And the engineers almost put all of the armor in the places where they found bullet holes. Until Abram Wald pointed out Hey, wait a minute, those are where we find bullet holes on the planes that come back. That means if we are going to add armor, we should do it there. We should do it where there aren't lots of dots, because these planes are probably getting shot all over. And when there is an absence of dots, instead of meaning that the planes don't get shot there, that probably means the planes that get hit don't come back to the base. And if you're wondering why I just spent all that time talking about something that seems unrelated, Another potential fly in the soup is what philosophers call criminalization, the process by which people become criminals. And you might be thinking, well, the process by which people become criminals is they break the f***ing law, surely. But what I mean is, if you have a high status job and a bit of money and a drug problem, you're probably going to get away with it because people look the other way when you're the boss, you don't have to commit crimes to fund your habit, and you can afford private treatment if you want it. But if you work a minimum wage job and you have a drug problem, you might end up in jail. People break the law all the time. Criminalization is about who actually gets nicked. Is it coming together yet? What I'm saying? The mugshots and everyone in them did not emerge in a vacuum. The answer to the question, do trans people on average commit more crimes than the average cisgender person, might actually be a yes, depending on what counts as a crime and whether or not you control for economic conditions. People in poverty are likely to resort to crime of desperation. They're less likely to be able to find help or less empowered to remove stressors in their life that might make them maladjusted. You can't just walk away from a stressful job if you don't know if you could find another. And for instance, there is a widespread prejudice against trans people that makes your job applications highly likely to be rejected. When I was a teenager and I looked much as I do now, I'd apply for jobs and I would put my birth name and I would mark M under gender. Back in 2007, we didn't have quite as many protections for transgender people in their employment as we do now. And it was pretty common for me to get laughed out of the office after dropping off my application. You know, every place I went where I had to give my identification was anxiety inducing because I had to put my transness at the front of the conversation. I was accused of stealing my identity several different times because I didn't look like what was on my paperwork. When I finally managed to change my gender marker, it was like night and day. I went from being laughed out of the jobs that I was applying to, to suddenly landing almost every single entry level position that I applied to. Changing my gender marker was one of the happiest moments of my life because finally, I was able to participate in public society the way that everyone does, without having to navigate around this silly little thing on my paperwork then you're a lot likely to be poor. And if you're poor and you're part of a demographic that is likely to be fetishized, one of the few ways out of poverty might be sex work, which is very highly policed, dangerous, and likely to be criminalized depending on where exactly you find yourself. 
And if you're poor and you're accused of a crime, you're a lot more likely to be found guilty because you can't afford a good lawyer. When you're more likely to be poor, you'll be pushed out of legal jobs and into illegal and dangerous jobs that don't actually make enough to lift you out of poverty, and more likely to be monitored and policed, you're vastly more likely to get arrested and less likely to afford legal representation. So you're vastly more likely to be found guilty once arrested. And there is factoring in implicit biases in the legal system itself, both among the officers who will arrest you for just being too pretty, Excuse my beauty. but among juries who are likely to have internalized the narratives about trans people being deceptive and dangerous. And the sum of all of those parts is that while when you control for wealth, trans people are no more or less likely to do crime or act unethically, we live in a socio-economic ecosystem that makes trans people more likely to be in poverty, they're likely to be put in difficult situations where people are more likely to resort to crime, more likely to be highly policed, and policed more harshly and therefore more likely to be found guilty of crimes, regardless of whether or not they did them or why. Consider the We Spa incident when hard-hitting journalist Turves discovered that the naked person with a Pepsi in the women's section might have been a sex criminal. Hey, wait a minute, is that? Ugh, and you know. Well, I'm sure that a known fascist just trying to help feminism. Well, let's examine a little more closely and there is evidence that these people's sex offenses were charges basically used to target sex workers and the unhoused. People who are unhoused frequently are forced to relieve themselves in public because they can't exactly go home and pee. And public businesses rarely let people use their bathrooms if they're not buying anything. The most recent charge was in 2018 of this person just using a locker room. No stated evidence of misconduct, just using a locker room. We have a case of someone being vilified as a habitual abuser and as evidence, they bring forward a criminal record. And the criminal record looks like this person was treated unduly harshly both by bootstrap individualism and hyper-scrutinist police. Like, these convictions don't actually indicate that she, much less trans people generally, are actually abusers. They're hoping to show you lots of pictures, anecdotes, examples of criminals who happen to be trans, or trans people who can be made out to look like criminals, and hope that you'll assume that being trans reduces your moral worth as a person, makes you more likely to be an abuser, and therefore, we should identify and eliminate that trait. But really, we should be asking is, why that connection exists? Is it reasonable to conclude that there is an inane problem with the entire demographic simply because of who they are? Or can we look at a socio-economic ecosystem they live in and ask if there is something we can change to make these bad outcomes less likely for everyone? Because if they did, they would realize that people's safety against rapists is more than just keep trans women out of women's bathrooms, lockers, prisons. One of the cis women featured in the BBC's A Sun Trans Women Sexually Predatory piece is a serial rapist. Good thing that bathroom was single sex. Totally prevented that rape between two cis women that happened anyway. And as an aside, trans people are by far not the only people who have historically had this issue of biased policy results being used as biased policy justification. If you want to be an anti-racist, which I hope you all do, you should be aware of how this fallacy in particular is used against people of color. There is a common phrase among white supremacists. Two numbers juxtaposed, 13 and 50. 13 is the rough estimate of how much of the United States population is black. 50 was the percentage of inmates in the United States who were black at one point in time. That number actually reflect deep injustice, major biases, and who got what opportunities, whose behavior was scrutinized more, and who was given the benefit of the doubt and when. Consider also that when Nazi Germany was trying to gain public support, they would exploit similar tactics of selective negative representation. The Stormer was a publication that gathered up criminal cases where Jewish people were found guilty or blamed, and published those and only those. No cases where Jewish people weren't the perpetrators or where they were the victims. And while that wasn't the only tactic of the party, we all know how well their propaganda worked. And we highly recommend Three Edwards' video essay, How Germany Turned Evil. 
And most recently, none other but the Orange Dictator himself floated the idea of a publication that would exclusively report on crimes committed by immigrants in order to add fuel to the rising problem of xenophobia and anti Central American racism in the United States that is still a problem to this day. The primary tactic of most forms of bigotry is, to paraphrase Abraham X. Kendi, to get people to individualize crimes committed by members of privileged groups, but generalize crimes committed by members of marginalized groups. When it comes to racism, they want you to see white criminals as lone wolves or isolated cases, but they want you to see accusations of criminality leveled at people of color as part of a pattern or as evidence, confirmation bias, that those people have some kind of a problem that should be applied to an entire group. And when it's transphobia, they want you to believe that trans people and our allies are abusers, predators, or sex abusers. And whenever any trans person is blameworthy, that person is seen as a quote unquote trans problem. But when a cis person is awful, it's just a bad individual, not representative of a systematic issue, such as transphobia. Update. Literally as we were getting ready to move into the voice stage of production, this happened. 57% of the trans identified males have convictions for sexual offences. Only 18% in the general population. There has been no research to support males being put in women's prisons. None! Uh, the high rates of sexual offences by trans women, as the BBC insists on calling them. You need to move away from that stonewall terminology. Trans identified males is clearer for the general public, and you need to do this prison story too. Maya is very clearly trying to imply that trans people are just innately dangerous, when in reality, trans people are more likely to be discriminated against in culturally accepted forms of employment, more likely to be fetishized. Those two factors combined make trans people significantly more likely to use sex work to pay for food and shelter. Everybody needs to survive. Sex work is highly criminalized. Trans people are more likely to be in poverty, including being unhoused, which further makes it more likely that they will be targeted by law enforcement. Once arrested, even on flimsy evidence, trans people are significantly less likely to have access to the money required to gather adequate legal defense. See the above. Once on trial, judges and juries have demonstrable biases against trans people, resulting in trans individuals being more likely to be found guilty, even when controlling for the strength of the evidence and degree of the blameworthiness of the behavior. All of this adds up to all of these factors being stacked against trans people, so of course, trans people are more likely to be treated harshly by law enforcement. And then all of these factors, every last one of them demonstrable with data and lived experiences are just swept under the rug. And the end result, free of any of that context, is pointed to by transphobes. Like seriously, this person was charged with crimes for doing survival sex work and people are asking why an unhoused person didn't go home to masturbate in private. But even when terms bring up points that they claim are leveled against males and not just trans people, you should exercise caution because often they're leaning on the same faulty logic and usually just using it as a gateway narrative. 98% of sexual assault is by males of any claimed gender. UK evidence shows that while ejaculators with women identity are given short sentences or let off with warnings because they are so delicate. TW are convicted for sex crimes at more than two times the rate of regular men. But what they're actually observing is not that sexual abuse by cis women is so improbable, but that there are differing social pressures on men and women on those abused by men and those abused by women. I've said this on Twitter, so I might as well come forward and say it on video. I am a survivor of rape. My abuser had the same genitals as me. And one thing I learned from my experience and the experiences of those around me who opened up when we realized we shared that kind of trauma is that while sexual abuse is just not taken seriously enough generally, when the victim is AMAP and the abuser is AFAP, and especially in cases of both, the odds of the abuse being taken seriously drops even further. If your trauma doesn't fit in the narrative of a big, strong male victimizing defenseless, delicate females, which is a fundamentally sexist narrative that pretends women have no moral agency, then people just generally ignore it and pretend it never happened. 
and to all the turfs out there spreading that narrative, be gone. Your anti-feminism is not wanted here. Special pleading. Special pleading is basically trying to use or demand very strange exceptions of how we assess things. A logical fallacy of asking for rules to be applied in some cases, but not others, without justification. For example, the Staniland question. Do you believe that male sexed people should have the right to undress and shower in a communal changing room with teenage girls? You'll notice several instances of special bleeding here. Why is the sex of either participant relevant? This is supposed to invoke the trove of trans women being predatory deceivers, merely pretending to be women so as to gain access to girls, particularly underage girls. But how come this particular trope is never evoked against trans men, claiming that they're just out to get access to little boys? If you say trans women should be able to change in women's locker rooms, like any other woman, they'll ask why do you support penis havers flashing little girls, which promotes two questions, where did it was ever okay to flash a kid, and why should the sex of either person matter when it comes to someone flashing someone else. They're trying to sneakily imply that a trans woman merely existing in a changing room, even if they're just discreet about changing, is automatically quote-unquote flashing little girls. But they never seem to think that a cis man in a changing room is quote-unquote flashing boys or dangerous or disrupting to other men who want privacy while changing. Why should someone feel more comfortable changing around other people so long as the other people all have the same genitals? Why is it suddenly disturbing to accidentally catch a glance of someone's junk in the locker room, but only if their junk is of a different structure than yours? They will claim they disbelieve in pink and blue brains, but there is only personality, and then at the same time assert that male bodies exhibit male behaviors, which is not basically the same thing? Or is behavior seated somewhere other than the brain? Now, hold on. They might think that behavior is literally stored in the balls? And now, how we apply this to transphobia? Why is it when a trans individual commits a crime, it's seen as evidence that trans people as a whole? But when a cis person does a crime, we don't ever ask if being cis makes you predisposed to criminality. Or is it a trans person minding their own business and discreetly changing in a locker room, quote unquote, flashing children, but we don't do anything about cis men who are indiscreet around children or cis women who are indiscreet around girls? Why is wearing an elegant dress embracing femininity and empowering when a cis woman does it, but it's modeling stereotypes and a man's idea of a woman when a trans woman does it? Why is it that when trans people are pushed into snapping at transphobes, it's hate, it's male violence, it's proof that trans rights are not a legitimate cause, and that all trans people should be deplatformed. But when transphobes are abusive and bigoted in other ways, hateful, even violent, it's swept under the rug, they refuse to acknowledge it, or in the rare case that they do acknowledge it, it's just a bad egg. It's not representative of the gender critical movement. Why is it institutional capture and bullying when people go through the channels of authority to try to address transphobia? But when gender critical people dock by women's charities, overwhelm trans allies with hateful comments and denunciations, and write petitions to disempower people who stand for trans people, it's doing what's right. So, the bullying of people to remove their names from the letters of support for stock and to educate themselves has begun, I see. Who's being targeted? One person has already withdrawn her name and posted a long apology about how she didn't understand the issues. <laughs> she since deleted those tweets though. Hey academic, why wasn't it bullying when she was assumably dogpiled by transphobes until she deleted said tweets, huh? Which leads us to... Group bias. An extension of this self-serving bias. Most of us are strongly biased to see our own actions as justified, reasonable, and assess ourselves positively. Sometimes, depending on our mood or complications in mental or emotional health, it might work the other way around. But in most cases, self-preservation and self-esteem require a reasonable amount of self-compassion and believing in yourself. But when it comes to group dynamics, our team is always better. The refs are just biased in favor of the other team. We never did a foul. They're cheating. Oh. Wow. That was a perfectly legal move, I'll have you know. And group bias is generally bad. 
Whereas there's an argument that we maybe should have a healthy level of surf serving bias for the sake of encouraging us to keep trying, so long as we're willing to admit our flaws and work on them. With group bias, it anecdotally seems to be more prevalent and more pronounced. That goes for almost every group dynamic I've seen. Again, anecdotal, but still, I'm pretty confident that this is correct because it's my opinion and I can't be wrong. That would harm my self image. For those to whom I might be unclear, this was in fact a self aware joke making fun of how self serving bias is often impediment to self awareness. But when it comes to political groups, oh boy, and TERFs are masters of trying to exploit this to turn you on their team by making trans people look like an other. The enemy of my enemy becomes my friend, at least in the eyes of TERFs, which is why they justify causing up to literal fascists and rapists. That's Posey Parker, who is still an active figure in the gender critical movement. So much so that she was in their group photo session of running around in inflatable dinosaur costumes, singing about genitals in ways that trans people wish we could get away with. Posey has called for cis men to use women's bathrooms, all but explicitly saying that she wants men with guns in women's bathrooms, lifting skirts and opening fire if they don't like what they see, and actively defend her tactics and the things she says and look the other way. Just, they just don't care. But to them, that's all okay because that's their bigot. Therefore, it's permissible. Meanwhile, TERFs actively run a website called turfisaslur.com where they document quote unquote threats of violence against TERFs. In fact, if you look, most of these specify anger directed TERFs, big meme energy. And I'm not going to defend threats of violence, especially not sexual abuse, that's just unacceptable behavior. But I will say that it's interesting that a bunch of random small accounts who might not even be trans people but false flag actors shouting into the void about people who choose to hate them and make their lives hell. Maybe that's not morally comparable to someone who wishing death on trans people or advocating for forced sterilization to trans people. Or that TERFs will openly defend Jermaine Greer who has openly bragged about wanting to sexually abuse underage boys. It's interesting to me that they act like people who threaten violence explicitly against bigots are treated like they represent trans people and the trans liberation movement as a whole. Even as trans communities denounce, disown, and ostracize people who display this plainly unacceptable behavior. When confronted with evidence of Fozzy Parker piling up with John Francois Gary P, this person asked me to explain the behavior of Dana Rivers, who I haven't heard of before, calling her a predominant leader of the trans activist community. Dana Rivers is a prominent leader in the TRA community who sued a school district, helped to shut down Mitchfest, and was on Oprah promoting trans ideology, is currently waiting trial for murdering a lesbian couple and their son. Totally like going on a podcast. I think this person expected me to defend how this person murdered a family of three. As of current, the last update I can see is that she pleaded not guilty on all accounts by a reason of insanity, and as of current, I have seen zero trans people saying that she should be exempt from accountability for literal freaking murder. But what I do see is a lots of transphobic outlets and sources putting up this person's transness in the headlines of the articles, putting transphobic narratives into the case of this individual trying to imply that her being trans was the cause of her violent outburst, or at least that her being trans made her predisposed to being violent, and that we should have um, criminally profiled or minority reported or conversion therapy this person, I guess. But again, this is an individual, and the trans community has largely denounced abusers, even ones who happen to be trans, and yet, the trans community is accepted to answer for someone they didn't choose to associate with. Dana didn't choose to be trans, other trans people didn't choose to be trans, much less anyone deciding to be trans because they like Dana Rivers. But Posey chose to go on the talk show of Gary B and chose this. She could have not been ignorant to his white nationalist rhetoric, audience, and goals, and yet, she chose to be a transphobe, chose to wish death on trans people, chose to advocate for forced sterilization. When the gender critical movement continues to choose to associate with her, in spite of all that, to try to justify her absurd bigotry because she's their bigot. And then get this, they have the nerve to claim that only trans people are abusive, but that transphobe and terse specifically are never abusive. 
I had a turf and now I'm not making this up though alas I don't have the screenshots anymore tell me that she hated me so much for sending up a trans ride that she was going to have two kids one a boy and one a girl and then torture and murder the boy while dotting on the girl like a queen as if a girl getting preferential treatment would upset me more than literal child torture and murder in and of itself and let's see what else we've got from TERFs, you know, who according to many TERFs are never ever abusive. Content warning. Holy shit, shit, shit. Oh, you wish I was old. Go fuck yourself, woke bro. I will chop your dick off and feed it to you and make you a trans woman. TRAs deserve the same treatment as all fascists. Trannies. Your families will never love you. You are living a lie and you know it. End your miserable existence. Commit suicide. Now. I hear bleach works internally as well, so give that a shot. If I ever lose control and physically attack Owen Jones, please let it be known that I will have nothing to do with his sexuality and political views and everything to do with him being a misogynistic, hate-filled tosser. I'll hold your coat. You can borrow my baseball bat. Wipe the blood off when you're done, Tar. It's alright, I have a walking stick. Right, I'm gonna fucking go for it now. Hashtag Radfem2013. You fucking weak, effeminate, gender conforming, patriarchal, cock sucking slag of a bitch. I would love to smash your face in with a brick. Stand on your feet and smash and smash every bone in your patriarchal handmaiden body to pieces with a baseball bat. I did note your silence when your side said that trans people should be lobotomized. But hey, I disagree with you, so I'm the abuser. You selfish, whiny, sewage brain fuck! I wish every bad thing in the world upon you! Go fuck yourself with knives! People only have the right to reproduce as their genetic sex. Trans women who are still legal females publicly have the right to be pregnant. But privately, they still have the right to fertilize children. Doctors who try and make them pregnant will go to jail and pay huge fines then that's wrong, and is indicative of a tyrannical government. What is your government going to do if they go abroad and become pregnant where there aren't bigoted laws like that? And let's just ignore for a minute that all governments are tyrannical. First, drop smart bombs to destroy the doctor's office and kill the doctors. Then, find and arrest the client. Anonymous asked, God, I hope your seizures are real and you fucking crack your skull open for one. Likes charge reblogs cast. Me. I have been traumatized by attacks by transphobes who hate me because of my presentation and attraction to men, and the weight of their hatred for me caused me to attempt suicide. This bitch. Emotional manipulation doesn't help either one of you. If you want to kill yourself, BC gay people aren't attracted to the opposite sex. I hope you succeed next time. One less bigot in the world. Anyway, can't wait to see what y'all come up with in support of this. How could she not know that TERFs don't like trans people? Oh, I think she knows. Lol. We only care about children. Hang yourself today! Being a twerf at least proves that we don't hate all trans people and want them dead. <laughs> but we're not trans exclusionary. We're trans women exclusionary. Twerfs. Huh. I'm teaching my daughter that if she sees any woman like that in female toilets or changing rooms, she's to kick them in the lady balls! Women who support trans women have to be some of the stupidest people on the planet. If there was ever an argument for eugenics and why some people shouldn't procreate, they are the picturesque example. Wait until trans women start replacing real women in your spaces. Honestly, if every heterosexual trans-identified person, male and female, dropped dead right now, I would throw a fucking party. I'm so sick of their fetishization, appropriation, and rape advocacy. They make me fucking sick. It's a shame that people can't do this in America. It's a man getting beaten up in Brazil for using the female toilet, taken from a GC Facebook group. <laughs> Not sure if it's sensitive, so I marked it as so. People who are mad about trans girls competing in high school sports because cis girls deserve athletic scholarships are going to be very excited to hear about my Make College Free For Everyone idea. I have an idea too. It involves a gun and pointing it to your head. Turfs and insults both agree on calling women females, hating trans people, perpetually angry, 
Women need men to protect them. Homophobia, conspiracy theories, and literally everything. Noose plus chair. Quickly. Non-binary people are made up neoliberal bollocks. They mostly have bollocks because they're narcissistic game bar men. What they lack is spans. Let me be suspended from this site for wishing death on non-binaries. If you believe in gender ideology and you try and teach it in a school I'm associated with, I will drive you out into a desert and bury you nine feet down. First, I will set you on fire and piss on your half-alive corpse. Fuck trans activism, fuck gender ideology, and fuck you. I hope somebody shoves a speculum right down your pee hole, you utter imbecile. Women's boundaries mean men who live as trans women should stay the fuck out of women's only spaces. I'm glad I live in an open carry state. Stepping away from Twitter today, Joe Biden has me out of character this morning and I don't want to take it out on any of you. Stay safe, keep fighting, and if I run into any males in the toilets during my errands today, start up a GoFundMe for my bail because I'm going to jail. Purple heart. Hey, Helen Stanlands, I found the perfect tree for your garden. <laughs> True, pretend he isn't harassing turfs. Always get hold of that rusty knife ready for males like this. You really like me, and that actually scares me. I'm pretty sure we all want to fucking murder your ass. At least I do. Word. I hope you get noticed by Kiwi Farms and bullied to suicide. Bye! Believe me, your day will come, and you will beg for mercy. Hello, it's me from thispersondoesnotexist.com. If there's such a thing as a lady brain in the wrong body, there should be a medical test. If that test could be done in the womb, we could have a simple test for trannyism. And abort the fuckers! Got this lovely message from a turf after I said that my cis girlfriend and I like BDSM. Stay awesome turfs, hashtag turfs are hate group, hashtag fuck turfs. If I knew you in real life, I'd crush your skull with a baseball bat. I'd cut your dick off and make you choke on it. I'd sit your throat and kick your head like a football until my shoes were covered in your blood and brain matter. Then crush your fucking balls. I hope you fucking die, you rapist tranny. You know what? Fuck it. Whenever I hear that a Tim has gotten murdered by another male or has committed suicide, I feel genuinely happy. It just sucks that it doesn't happen as often as they claim. I wish there was an epidemic of these men dying. They are a disease. Watching my teen daughter having to go through the continual shit of growing up female is making me a little homicidal about trans activists. Gender critical turfs just fantasizing over the CEO of mermaids being raped in prison. But of course it is the TRAs who are violent misogynists. Hashtag turfs are a hate group. All those ruined lives, thanks to mermaids. Susie Green needs her day in court, and then a few decades in prison. Maybe where Karen White is placed. Ooh, I like this tweet a lot. See how comfortable she is with Karen. Maybe they could be bunk buddies. Women, remember when you see a male in your changing room, that difference is okay. Men, say so. I'll be sure to tell my daughters. I'll be telling mine to remember to fire a minimum of four shots and aim for the center of the threat to your life. Interesting, isn't it? Trans women are murdered for using women's facilities, but then trans folks call trans women the quote unquote the threat to their life. Oh, and don't forget all of the sexual harassment and baseless slander calling trans people and allies perverts, such as when they call David Paisley a pedophile. Or this? Just one of the hundreds of disgusting tweets or DMs I have received today. <laughs> Linda watches as her girlfriend makes her way across the room. Her penis standing proud, tumescent, her balls heavy and swaying with each step. <laughs> because it's fine to sexually harass people if you're doing it in a transphobic way. It's not lesbophobic because Linda follows Stonewall rules, so she's bisexual. Not lesbian. That would be disgusting to send to a lesbian, but my folk like dick. Ever heard of percentages? Shame. Pray tell. Are the middle-aged women killing the TRAs? Why don't you direct the little energy you have to fighting the men? You know, your counterparts. 
Middle-aged women are assaulting trans women in bathrooms and making their children homeless. You're not innocent. They sound badass! I love that for them. And now it's time for a little aside where we discuss group culpability. Any TERVs or transphobe apologists watching this might be thinking to themselves, but crit fact, you're using the same tactic you're so harshly condemned. As if all of that was me using the Stalin exemplar fallacy against transphobes. To which I say, no. Because there is a fundamental difference between pointing out group culpability of an unchosen demographic like sexual orientation, sex, gender, race, and group culpability of an ideological movement. People do not choose to be trans or not, it's just not a choice, and neither is sexual orientation or race or sexual characteristics at birth. None of those parts of who you are control any other parts of your conduct. They compel you into a certain morale framework, they don't obligate you to take any actions. You still have free will and agency as a human being, regardless of any of these characteristics. A trans person who is a sinner or a saint is that way because of their choices as an individual. And these choices cannot and should not be generalized to trans people as a whole. But being a turf or any kind of a transphobe is a choice, as is being any other kind of bigot. It's an ideology, a set of beliefs and attitudes. And when the logical conclusion of an ideology is mistreatment, harassment, and abuse, then it's not a salient exemplar to point out people who follow that path to its logical conclusion. It's a prognosis. But good news, you don't have to wind up like Posey Parker or a committed career transphobe like Maya Forstater or Magdalene Burns. You can always just stop being a transphobe, but trans people just can't stop being trans, nor is there any reason for them to do so. System Justification and Appeal to Authority System justification is a complex subject, and we can do a whole video on it. Luckily, a friend of ours already did. Check out Jangles' video essay, link in description. But basically, system justification is when examining the injustices of a system would be painful. So, we don't. Or, we just make up excuses. Consider how most supply lines under our current economic and production model rely on overt and unconscionable exploitation. And not just, we are all exploited by our need to survive, but like, sweatshops and third world kind of exploitive labor. Sweatshops are plainly unethical, but we find excuses to overlook it. Oh well, they're probably better off than if we hadn't employed them. Some even go as far as to say, oh, everyone does it, or how will we stop it? There is too much injustice in the world for any one person to confront it all at once and not be emotionally destroyed. The world is too big and complex for us to comprehend and process it all, much less at the same time. And so, often we, when confronted with something we can't deal with directly, we just find a reason to dismiss it. I mean, for example, yeah, but capitalism has lifted the most people out of poverty. As if a system being the most widely implemented means it's the best one. But if we don't have police, who will you call when your house gets broken into? As a way to imply that the victims of police brutality are acceptable collateral damage? Police brutality victims died so someone could show up an hour later and take notes and never get back to you. What a good trade you made. And how does this apply to transphobia? Was it all of this use of the salient exemplar tactic, but system justification for transphobia? Transphobia isn't just the attitudes of an individual. Transphobia is a system, and the people upholding it aren't just trying to be mean to people they don't follow the rules but they're trying to tell themselves that the rules they want us all to abide by are necessary for everyone's safety. We need female-only spaces because transes do rapes, they say. Hashtag not our crimes. Hashtag child safeguarding. Hashtag wished. We need to exclude trans women from self-reporting their gender identity on the census because that will skew demographic research data and then we won't be able to allocate resources properly for real women, they say. Ah uh, yes, because the 1% of the population that happens to be trans will skew the data so much that we won't be able to fund women's shelters. Here, I thought the problem with women's shelters getting enough funding was because of money that our government should be putting towards helping those in poverty and survivors of violence, but instead, they're putting in towards a bloated military and subsidizing already flourishing corporations. But yeah, 
let's blame trans people for a lack of government funding to women's shelters because that makes sense to them. They will openly defend a legal definition of rape that erases many victims. Breaking. Kings Canyon Unified School District teacher Crystal Jackson, 39, is accused of rape after having sex with her former student, 14-year-old boy. Don't know about you, but I'm sick of pretending science ain't real just to humor a few delusionists. Legal definition. The legal definition of rape is penetration with the penis of the vagina, anus, or mouth of another person without their consent. Because to them, it's okay if someone who was sexually abused by anyone who doesn't have a penis or doesn't use one, and then has their trauma treated as lesser than any other kinds of sexual abuse, just as long as there is a handy technicality that lets them still rape statistics in their own favor. The sum total of the Salin example fallacy is manufacturing justification for bigotry, for bigoted policies, for bigoted attitudes, and bigoted beliefs. They carefully collect every news article they can find of a trans person, put that instance on blast so it takes up a disproportionate amount of space in our minds compared to crimes by anyone who's not trans. And then, when they say we need to kick trans women out of bathrooms, they can easily invoke an individual and create an illusion that we need to treat trans people as a group with the suspicion that they might be the next Karen White. For conclusion, we can learn to recognize this tactic and smash it wherever we see it. And I mean wherever, against whomever. Whenever you see someone upholding an individual and saying, ah, so that's what they are like, to try to vilify an entire group based on unchosen characteristic, you can say, no, that's bigotry. You're trying to push a narrative about a group based on individuals. You're cherry picking. You're applying special pleading, group bias, and making faulty assumptions about causation. Point out the flaws, point out the hate tactics, and eventually they will stop gaining traction if enough people are able to point out what is being done and why. This isn't to say that any of us will become immune to propaganda, and if we're intellectually rigorous and ethically diligent, we will learn to spot dishonest tactics, take mental countermeasurements, and not to be impacted, at least not to the same extent and be able to flag those using these dishonest tactics as the hate mongers that they are, and eventually they won't get taken seriously. People will know and ignore them to disbelieve and reject the false narratives that they're trying to plant. The same way we all know to tell the Westro Baptist Church to go away and give them zero of our consideration. And before I go, I want to reinforce a point that I mentioned earlier. My own exposure to the Salient Exemplar tactic was about 7 or 8 years ago, when I was in a voice chat for a friend of a friend's World of Warcraft guild. We had conversations and voice chat between raids, and one of them wandered into politics, and the murder of Trayvon Martin came up. I was firmly on the side of, murder is bad and equality is good, and then, that's when someone sprang on me with the white supremacist line Despite making only 13% of the population, black people make up 50% of violent crimes. And I was floored. He pulled up verified sources that the claim was technically correct, and knew in my gut that the narrative he was going for was racist and wrong. But at the same time, I didn't yet have the tools to disassemble the complex machine of hatred. But I started looking into it, trying to figure out why that pattern existed, and in intellectual honesty won the day. I was able to put together the missing pieces and notice the things that this person was intentionally leaving unsaid, and replace his racist narrative with an accurate anti-racist one. He was trying to imply that being black in and of itself caused people to commit crime, but the actual dynamic at play turns that melanin does not correlate to behavior, but Rather, discrimination for centuries has resulted in people of color being less likely to have familial wealth. Discrimination that is still a demonstrable problem leads to people of color being more likely to be in poverty. Policy makers actively put additional police into areas with a higher population of people of color, which results in over-policing and finding crimes that don't really exist. Conscious and unconscious biases in officers results in people of color being treated with more suspicion and readiness to resort to force. Higher poverty rates mean less access to legal representation. Demonstrable biases in judges and juries. 
certain behaviors and commerces such as marijuana being illegal when there is no ethical reason for the war on drugs and then police people of color more intensely when white people use the same drugs anyway like it's so analogous to transphobia policy sets people up to be in bad situations criminalizes how people survive in those situations or hyper police how people respond to those situations and treating them with bias once accused as a result, more of these people are criminalized despite there being no innate difference in moral worth resulting from these characteristics and the net result of that criminalization. Artificially elevating incarceration rates is then treated as evidence that these groups are fundamentally morally inferior. What I wanted to do with this video is something I wish I had done for myself those years ago. I want to arm people who are in the situation that past me was in. I want to give you this hammer and ask you to do something. The handle is made of recognizing the tactic. The head is made of the willingness to call it out and to forward this knowledge to others so they don't fall for it. And what I want to ask of you now is to smash this device whenever you see it. Against whoever you see it, wheel it against. Whether that be a turf spamming pictures of Karen White, as if that's a representation of trans people's moral worth generally, or a clown avatar seeks out cringe content of marginalized people to point a mocking spotlight on, or a fascist apologist who very selectively posts videos of criminal activity by people who happen to fit a certain stereotypical profile, take this hammer and use it well. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Hi everyone, um, this is Nash Romy. Hi, um, that comics guy on Twitter, I guess. I just want to thank everyone for having me narrate this episode and I am so sorry for the quality of my recording and my mumbling and pronunciations. Really, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, everyone. And thank you for watching this video. And I hope you're having, I hope you're all having a wonderful day. Thank you. To our fans and Patreon supporters, Thank you so much for tuning in and supporting the channel. We really appreciate having you guys here. And if you like this video, please share it. Have a nice day.